minute. You can be seated. Hebrews 11, we're going to be in verse 23 here this evening, picking up with our next one last week. Or, well, last week we had our Thanksgiving service. The week before we looked at Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. But this week we're going to be looking at Moses and Moses' parents, actually. Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, as we go through here, we're looking for evidence that these people believed in something that they couldn't see. They, they believed in another, another place, uh, another power. And uh, in the case of, we'll, we'll allude to it a little bit later, Abraham, you remember, it says that he, he looked for a city who, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Meaning he wasn't, he wasn't all wound up in this stuff. He was looking at a, at a higher level. He was, he was tuned in and focused on God and what God would do for him. But we're going to start with Moses here this evening. We're going to start off in verse 23 with his parents, actually, who had faith to de defy an ungodly order. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born... Which would make us think, well, we're talking about Moses, but Moses had nothing to do with the decisions that were made during this period of time. Moses was just an infant. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. This is referring to the faith of Moses' parents, uh, which their names were, do you remember? Jochebed, and his father's name was Amram. So you have Amram and Jochebed. Jochebed is listed for us. She's named in Exodus 1 and 2, uh, where Amram we find from, from genealogies later on in, in the Bible. Uh, but this is referring to the faith of his parents. Their story is found in Exodus 1 and 2. You can flip back there if you'd like, and we'll, we'll allude to that just a little bit and get some of the information that we need for Hebrews from Exodus 1 and 2. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, we get the background to what happened, what, what kind of led up to Moses. Exodus 1, 8 says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And that made all the difference. Remember, the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel, came down to, Israel, or down to Egypt uh, while, while Jacob was still alive. They were fleeing the famine. They came down and they settled, do you remember the, the portion of land? They lived in Goshen, which would be the northeast corner of Egypt. And that was where they settled. And for the period of time that they lived under Joseph and under that Pharaoh, they had great, uh, they had great freedom. And then probably a couple kings after that, while Joseph's memory was still good, but then another king arose who knew not Joseph. And that's when the trouble started. At the recommendation of his counselors, this pharaoh placed the Hebrews who lived in the land of Goshen into slavery. He, he decided, we've got to figure out a way to keep them down. We can't allow them to have free reign. We can't allow them to continue on uh, even multiplying how they are. So he decided that in order to stem the, the tide of Hebrew population, he makes a decree in, he, in Exodus 1, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, every daughter ye shall save alive. So a lack of care for uh, the unborn and for the newly born, that should bring up some, uh, some remembrances to you of the day in which we live. But Amram and Jochebed had their third child <coughs> under this mandate from the king. After he gave this decree, she got pregnant and delivered their child. He was a, a three-month-old, the Bible tells us here. They, that's their first mention in, here in Hebrews 11. His parents hid him for three months. They hid a newborn. Can you imagine? That would, that would take some doing. Yeah, I've, I've been around some newborns, and they haven't <laughs> made one yet who's easy to hide. But his parents hid him. For three months, it says, because he was a proper child. Proper. The, the word means, the Greek word means handsome or fair. And you'd say, well, 
Well, what if he'd have been an ugly baby? Would they, would they you know, that, that wouldn't have gone well. Is, it, is that why they saved him? Because he was because he was a beautiful child? No, that's that's not that's not exactly what it means. Exodus 2, verse 2, in the Old Testament, it says, and when she saw him that he was a goodly child. Again, the same idea, handsome. He was a, he was a fair child. But if you go to Acts 7, you find Stephen's sermon. You remember Stephen preached uh, a message to the people who were getting ready to stone him. And Stephen started with Abraham, and he brought them all the way up to the present. And he, he just gave them a big, long lecture on Israel's history. And in that, he talks about Moses. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 20, we get the, the good definition that gives us a little bit more light on Hebrews uh, Hebrews eleven twenty three, It says in Acts 7, 20, this is Stephen speaking, he says, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. The words exceeding fair, if you, if you have a Bible concordance, if you go, you'll find that one, of, that's, a, that's a compound word, and one of those words is theos, which is God. Meaning, Moses was fair in the eyes of God. That's, that's what that means. So when it says that sh they, they looked on him that he was a proper child, that he was a goodly child, that he was exceeding fair, meaning, uh, yeah, every, every baby is beautiful to the mother, but Moses was fair. He was special in the eyes of God. Do we find any more in Scripture where his parents were told we don't know. We don't know, but it is it is possible. Maybe, maybe their willingness to un to defy this unlawful order was was due to some information that God had given to them. That that's possible, but we don't know that exactly. But his parents were willing to defy this order, obeying God rather than men, according to Acts five, <laughs> because God places a high value upon human life, doesn't he? And so his parents, unwilling to, to sacrifice their child to a government edict, a government mandate, they, they withheld. They kept their son out. They disobeyed the order of the king. Would they have had, would, because of this order, would the parents have had to destroy their own children? Or would they send a Gestapo? Or the parents were supposed to do the, were supposed to do it. And if they didn't, then the midwives were supposed to, to assist in the in the murder of the children. In verse 23 here in our text, we see that they did two things, but we have two sentences, essentially. It says they hid their son. They, they hid him for three months, and then it got to the point where we, we can't hide him anymore. But it says also they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Again, perhaps to what John said, perhaps they had some special revelation that God was going to use their son in a special way. That's possible. God was was very definitely speaking in that way, but we don't know that. That would be all conjecture on our part. Perhaps they just placed their confidence in God to honor their obedience to him rather than the king. Lord, we're going to, we're going to do what you said, which is it's interesting because we, we don't have thou shalt not kill yet, do we? That, that comes later, right? That mm -hmm. Exodus 20 is where we find that, when, when Moses received the Ten Commandments. So how do they know that you're not supposed to kill your children? But by conscience, right? The Bible says that the law of God is written on your hearts. You know, you, you can go the world around and there's not a society where, where it is admirable to kill your children. There are some societies where they have killed children and it has been, it has been culturally acceptable, but there's no parents the world around who, who have that desire innately. Now, can, can you breed that into people? Can you get people to the point where they're twisted enough in their thinking that they will murder their children? Absolutely, you can. But it's, it's written on the heart of men. So his parents knew, God doesn't want us to do this. We're not going to kill our child because Pharaoh says so. And so perhaps they just cast themselves on the mercy of God. We, we, we don't know that they had special revelation, but perhaps they did. So it's no longer possible for Jochebed to hide her baby. So in Exodus 2, verse 3, she placed him into a basket, daubed it with pitch, and pushed it out into the Nile. 
Now, she didn't just push it out there with the thought of letting it go. She did have her daughter, Miriam, go out there, and Miriam was to follow the basket. And obviously, you remember the story. It came into the presence and was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. So the princess of Egypt discovers this basket, opens it up, and realizes that uh, this is one of the Hebrew children. And so rather than follow her father's orders, the princess also decided to take the child as her own. She, she could have, in obedience to her father, she could have just pushed the basket down. But she didn't. Why? Well, because God has his hand on Moses, I believe, already even at this early date. And he said to Moses to spare to look at. So she <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. She must have thought he was a cute baby because I, I, I've I, seen babies before that I've just thought <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you always try to be careful when somebody shows you a picture of a newborn. You say, "Well, that is a baby." <laughs> you know, you know, you, be sure it's a cute little thing. No, that's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> you, gotta, you just got to be careful. <laughs> yes, yeah. But God's got His hand on Moses, and so Miriam walks up to the princess who's holding her brother, and she says, "Would you like me to find a Hebrew nurse for this Hebrew child?" And guess who she picked? Well, obviously, she went to her mother, Jochebed. And Jochebed went to the princess and was given charge of her own son again, only she was now paid to care for her own son. And while she was caring for her son and nursing her son, she brought him up. She trained him and nurtured him in the things of God for, as, for a short period of time. We're not talking till he was 12 or 13. We're talking till he was four, maybe five. On the outside, maybe five, until he went back and he was given back into the into the into the control of Pharaoh's daughter. Because of the faith of his parents to defy the ungodly order of Pharaoh, Moses was saved, raised by his mother until he was returned to Pharaoh's house. It's amazing how God works all of this out. It's amazing if you've ever watched the Ten Commandments. Maybe you've, you've seen the old movie that came out. I don't even remember what year it was. But Cecil B. DeMille comes out at the beginning and he gives a speech where he talks about how that you couldn't write it better than the Bible did. You, the, 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 the story arc of Moses is something that doesn't really even dawn on somebody who writes fiction. God, God worked everything together to, to have his mother paid to take care of him and raise him up to a certain point before he went into the, into the presence of of his, his adopted mother, the princess of Egypt. One commentator says it this way. He says, trying to improve on God's plan is more pretentious than taking a felt-tipped pen and trying to improve the Mona Lisa. Our scribbling would do nothing but ruin the masterpiece. God needs our obedience, not our help, our trust, not our counsel. He makes the plans, and we walk in them by faith. That's exactly what his parents did. We don't, know, we don't know what God's going to do with this boy who he's given to us, but we're not going to kill him. We're going to, we're going to put him into the hands of God, and God gave him right back the same day, only now she's paid to raise him. The faith of Moses' parents saved his life, but it also steered him toward the saving of his soul, I believe. Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old... Will not depart from it. Again, Amram and Jochebed had Moses for a very short period of time. From, from when he was one until he was four, maybe five, on the outside. But this this bears out what I believe one of the one of the maybe Stalin, somebody said, Give me a child until he's seven and I'll have him for life. Yep. There's I there, believe that was not a direct quote. Yeah. There are several men who have said very similar things. Who, Yeah, you, you have a child when they're very young. We, we talked about this a little bit when we were going through 1 Samuel. Hannah had Samuel for how long? Till he was weaned. So again, three, <coughs> four, maybe, maybe on the outside five. And then she put him into the hands of Eli. Well, actually, she put him into the hands of God, but she did all that she could to raise him, direct him, and, and kind of mold him into the way that he should go, and he, he did. Doubtlessly due to the faith of his parents and the protection and guidance of God, Moses went from being protected by his parents' faith to his own faith. And we come to that in verse 24. 
faith to reject an ungodly life. In verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Though only exposed to the godly teaching of his parents for a short time, the seeds of truth, once planted, did eventually come to maturity. So don't, don't negate the time you get to spend with little ones. Your, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, any children who you have the opportunity to speak into their, their upbringing or into their training, take it and, and go with it because God can use that in tremendous ways. <coughs> the Bible tells us that when he was come to years, which if we had to just guess, we'd say, well, I, 13 would be when a Jewish child was considered to be a man, so... Let's, let's go 18, but that's not what it was. We don't have to conjecture. Again, in Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, we read, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So he came to years at 40, is what we're told here in Acts 7. So... He's raised by his mother for three years, four, maybe five, and then for the next 35 years, approximately, he's learned in the ways of the Egyptians, which Egypt at the time, you have Egypt was the, the Middle Eastern Kingdom, China was already up and going, but obviously he wasn't exposed to that. You have two real superpowers in the world at that time, and he's in the big one. He's in Egypt where he's getting all of the knowledge, all of the, all of the learning that he can get. Who did the Hebrews have been a darker-skinned people than the Egyptians? Would not, her, would not her father knew that this was a Hebrew child or not? Yeah, very, very possibly. Uh, if, you, if you look now at Egyptians, there are some Egyptians, very, very not very fair like we would be, but they would be lighter, more of an olive skin. And then there are some, Egypt is North Africa. And so depending on where you go in Egypt and kind of the tribal area that you are, there are very dark Egyptians and there are more light Egyptians. And the average, the average Jewish person would be darker than we are, but lighter than... Well, I just wondered why her father would have allowed this to, for him to be raised in yeah, it, it's 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 really it's really anybody's anybody's guess. Could could be that he was a little bit darker. Could be that she kept him from the eyes of her father for a period of time. And I, I don't know. It's yeah. It's there's a lot there's a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to to the life of the early life of Moses for sure. But at forty years old, when he came to years, he made a conscious choice. He rejected the niceties and the pomp of being adopted into a royal family. He was, because he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have been, by default, the adopted grandchild of the, the world, the, the leader of the world at that point. It tells us why. It says in verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The only explanation for this is faith. The only explanation that makes any sense is that the, the five years or so that his mom had him in her care, his mom and dad had him in their care, in that period of time, they were able to give Moses enough knowledge about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he was able to take that going forward and to have faith. To suffer affliction means to be ill-treated in company with, to share persecution, or to come into a fellowship of ills. In Exodus chapter 1 verse 23, we're told of the suffering. It says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor or cruelty, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick, in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor or cruelty. So, the children of Israel, they, they don't have a good life. They were slaves in every, in every way that you could define that, in a, in a negative sense. That's what they were. But he would rather endure the suffering with God's chosen people than to, endure, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, or the temporary pleasures. 
The pleasures of sin have a short shelf life. The expiration date on sin, the, the pleasures, it's, it's always quicker than you think it will be. And Moses had an awareness of that. He think of the think of the maturity, the spiritual maturity of a young man who's lived most of his life, 35 years of his life, in royalty, having his needs and his wants met, but making a conscious choice at the age of 40 to say, no, I'm not doing this. This is wrong. I'm instead, I'm going to choose this route, which is the route of suffering. I'm going to suffer with my people who are God's people than enjoy the pleasures of, of royal life. He had faith, again, to look ahead. Like we mentioned in starting about Abraham, in verse 26, it says, He was esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Again, Abraham, he was willing to dwell as a sojourner in the land that God had promised him because he wasn't focused on the temporal. Abraham was willing to say, you know what, I don't have this land now, but I have confidence that God will give me all that, is the, all that he has promised. Verse 10 of Hebrews 11 says, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't focused on the temple. He wasn't looking horizontally. He was looking vertically at God. And that's what Moses was doing. Moses wasn't looking just on the horizontal. If Moses had been, what would have been the wise choice? If all he was doing was looking this way, what would have been the wise choice? Not say anything. Stay in the palace, man. Why on earth would you go out there and be in the fields with your, with your people? But he, he wasn't just looking this way. He was looking this way. And he understood, no doubt due to the teaching of his parents, these are God's chosen people. These are my people. I would rather suffer with them than live in luxury in the pleasures of sin. It would very easily, it would have been very easy for me to say, if I stay here, maybe I'll get the ruler over my people and then I can ease their burden. I mean that'd be my thinking, I guess. Without without question. That would be that would be my thought. <laughs> uh, well think of all the good I can do. If I if I just live this life, think of all I can do for the people. Well he wasn't willing. He wasn't willing to endure the sin because he valued the eternal. The Bible tells us here in this verse, esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For for Moses, it wasn't even a big sacrifice. It just made sense. No, I'm going this way because this is what God wants. I'm going to go with God's people, my people. Moses has this similar forward-looking. Distant faith. He looked around him in Pharaoh's house, saw the treasures that could be his if he would only turn from his true heritage and embrace the life of luxury in this pagan culture. But then Moses looked at God's chosen people, his people, and, through their, and, and, and though theirs was a much more difficult existence, he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. I'd, I'd rather have what they get in the end than what they have now. The pleasures of sin for a season versus the pleasure of God. Psalm 37, 16 says, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. That's, that's true, and it plays out in the life of Moses. Moses understood the reward of choosing to identify himself with Jehovah and his chosen people was a better reward than the temporal gain he would amass as Egyptian royalty. And he would have amassed a considerable sum as Egyptian royalty. They, they made good money. But he held back. Why? Because I, he had respect. I, I would rather be right this way than have all that, all that the world can offer me. So this evening, we'll stop there with Moses. We could go on, but we would, we would go long. This evening we've seen, number one, in his parents, we've seen faith to defy an ungodly order handed down from an, an ungodly authority. Why were they willing to reject the, the authority of the king? Well, because they had faith in a God who they couldn't see. Faith is the 
substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We see number two, in Moses himself, faith to trust that which is most precious into the hands of God, counting on him for the outcome. We see this in both. His mom, think of the, think of the faith that Jochebed had to have when she pushed that basket out into the Nile. That's faith. Think of Moses' faith when he finally said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not, go I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be something that I'm not. I'm a Hebrew. And I'm, I'm throwing in my lot with the Hebrews, though that doesn't make sense to anyone else. And then lastly, faith to reject the temporal, worldly pleasures in light of the reward promised to those who will obey. This faith means looking into the future and trusting in God rather than the instant gratification of the flesh. This is still how we should live, because the world still has a bunch of pleasures that it offers to us, doesn't it? And, and we live in a society where we like instant gratification. I, well, I want it now. I don't want to wait. I want to have all of those pleasures now. But the Bible tells us in Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodly lust, un ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Well, because we're looking, verse 13, for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Moses was willing to say no to self and yes to suffering because he said, I'd rather have the pleasures that last for eternity than the pleasures that last temporarily. And, and if we're smart, we'll make that same choice on a day-by-day, -day, even sometimes moment-by-moment -moment basis. This, this would make me happy now. This would please God and bring him pleasure, which will bring me true and lasting pleasure. We have to make a choice. Somebody said that a lot of people blow it because they give up what they really want for what they want right now. And that's true. Because we, we get all bent out of shape by, oh, I gotta have it now. And if we wait, well, God would give, it, would give us something usually much better than what we thought we wanted. 